Folks, today we are going to study Antonio Gramsci and uh, the way we are going to manage uh, uh, our examination of uh, Gramsci is that, as you know, I gave you one reading but I broke it up into two parts. So we will be looking at the first part which is approximately 32 pages in which his uh, focus is uh, his criticism of uh, economism, what we call economism. But in the process of criticizing economism, you see that he develops many, many interesting new and different ideas about his he uh, hegemony, about uh, political and civil society, about the state, about the relationship between the economic base and the superstructure, and so on. And all of those ideas are very, very pertinent, although they all emerge out of the singular strand of criticizing economism. Um, I hope that most of you have done the reading. Can, you, can we just do a quick show of hands to see who has attempted the reading? Okay, that's wonderful. And how many people felt comfortable with it, uh, um, you know, that it was, it was okay in terms of the difficulty level? I managed to get maybe 60, 70 percent of it. Okay, found the reading too difficult. Stopped reading because it was too difficult. Didn't read because it was too difficult. Okay. <laughs> Didn't read at all? Okay, so I completely empathize with the f those who were, are unable to uh, sort of extract from the reading what's going on because, well, there's two major reasons for that. The first is that Gramsci is responding to various people in his own time frame who are writing about Marxism, writing on behalf of Marxism, or writing against Marxism. And so in responding to them, he's more or less assuming that you know the people or at least know the arguments that those people have made and that you're familiar with both Marxism as well as the arguments with which he's dealing. So it's kind of, again, once again, a situation where you're entering into a debate in the middle of the debate rather than being introduced to all the terms. That's the first major difficulty. The second major difficulty is that these writings were writings that Gramsci wrote while he was in prison. And so the access that he had to various books and sources of information were naturally limited. Although he did have access to some, but it was not by his choice what he had access to. Moreover, he had to write things in a way that sometimes he was using terms deliberately. He was using code names, or, or rather he was changing the terms he could have written it much more simply. For example, he could have just said, the philosophy of Marxism says X, Y, Z. But you'll notice, or Marxism says X, Y, Z. But you notice he doesn't use that term. He uses the term, the philosophy of praxis, leaving many of us thinking, what is that? And how is that different from Marxism? And how does that relate to ex everything? And so on. And he uses a number of terms in this particular way. For example, there are a number of passages where he writes about nations fighting in military wars. Whereas you can very clearly see that what he really means is classes fighting in them. The reason why he can't write classes is because everything he's, write, he's writing is going to be read by the prison authorities. So he has to somewhat change the meaning here and there in order for it to pass the censors. And you really have to be sort of more or less aware what he's getting at in order to really understand what he's talking about. So for these two reasons, number one, the fact that he's jumping into the middle of the debate. Sorry, you're jumping into the middle of a debate that you're not familiar with. Uh, you need a prior knowledge of Marxism and the debates around it, and for the reason that he's trying to avoid the prison censor. Otherwise, the, pris the censor of the prison will say, sorry, but we're confiscating these writings. We're not going to allow them to be given to your family or your friends or comrades or whatnot. So he's trying to avoid that. And thirdly, of course, he's writing mostly out of memory. What a phenomenal memory he had, really, to be so productive in prison is quite phenomenal. Interestingly, Fez Ahmed Fez, uh, the great Pakistani poet and critic of uh, the establishment and uh, left-wing progressive figure, the iconic left-wing progressive figure of Pakistan, also wrote most of his most famous poems while being in prison. I think the reason why people get so productive sometimes in prison is that they get an awful amount of time that they have nothing at all to do with. Because uh, there's, you know, I mean, there's really nothing you can do while you're sitting there. So some people like to, you know, sort of hit the gym and work out and become huge. And other people like to read and write and so on. 
and uh, write phenomenal things. Another ex great example of someone who really developed intellectually while being in prison is Malcolm X, who went into prison uh, for one reason and came out of prison a completely reformed and changed person, uh, ready and willing to fight for the rights of Af the African American community. So, but this is a particularly brutal prison, and it was particularly brutal for Gramsci, because this is a prison under Italian fascism, and they, of course, had no love lost for, for Antonio Gramsci. And it was very difficult for Gramsci as well, because he had very developed, he already had, and further developed very, very serious health problems while in prison, and died at a very young age. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine that this, is, this was you know, no walk in the park, so to speak. So Gramsci gets his name from a town in uh, eastern Albania, which is called Gramsci, and that's just changed into its Italian sort of name, Gramsci. He wasn't born in, uh, in Albania, uh, but it's probably his grandparents or his great-grandparents were born there, and they migrated to Italy, but they kept the, the surname of the village. It's a bit like what happens in Pakistan, that many of us have, uh, uh, if, if you're not so urban as, as you people are, Many of us will have surnames that belong to our, our villages, etc. You know, we'll have, um, I don't know, uh, Faisal Lailpuri or something, you know, um, and so on. So that's the name that the family retained. He was, uh, he grew up, he was born and he grew up in this, um, uh, in Sardina, which is, uh, as you can see, an island, which is part of Italy. Uh, his father was, uh, in 1898, convicted of corruption. Probably there was a PTI government at the time, who knows? And, uh, and he was then uh, imprisoned. And as a consequence of the imprisonment of his father, uh, the family was, became completely destitute. Not that they were very well off before, but now they became very, very poor. In fact, be they became so poor that Gramsci had to stop his schooling and, sat to, and, and had to do work in order to make, had to do odd jobs to make ends meet. Um, Finally, his father was released in 1904, and Gramsci could then thereafter continue his schooling and so on and so forth. Gramsci suffered from child, from, from very early on, from his childhood, with very, very severe health problems. Uh, he had a terrible malformation of the spine, which stunted his growth and meant that he was not even five feet tall. He was shorter than five feet tall. And he, had, he was hunchbacked because of that malformation of the spine. And for the longest time, the Gramsci family believed that his caretaker had accidentally dropped him when he was a kid, and that's why his spine, something wrong happened to his spine. But subsequent research has sort of proven that he had a disease uh, which caused that malformation to occur. That's Gramsci at the age of 15. Uh, very Italian-looking boy, as you can see. That's his father, and that's his mother with his sister. Just thought I'd share those photographs with you. There aren't a lot of photographs of Antonio Gramsci. Um, actually, there's only a couple, and I tried to make do with the ones that were available. I went to a website called uh, the International Gramsci Society, which had these very rare photographs which are not often shared, um, or not often public. I mean, I'm, they're not secret or anything. Um, so yeah, I think one of the reasons is that he spent most of his adult life behind bars, and obviously people were not really, he was not, there was not going to be a photographer to go there and have a look at him. In 1911, when Gramsci was, uh, he was a brilliant student, and in 1911, he managed to win a scholarship to this um, amazing university, that's the University of Turin, and which is, of course, where he made his name as a leftist and so on and so forth. I don't know if you can see this very clearly because of the light, but, the, you know, you can look at the architecture, it's absolutely magnificent, it looks like a palace, and the, and the lawn over here is perfectly manicured with a design on it, which, of course, it needs a lot of work to, to do something of that sort. So a highly, you know, sort of a, an elite university, a, a very, you know, sort of good university, where he, you know, he really excelled in philosophy and other things, uh, and I think he really came into his own. In 1913, soon after university, he joined the Italian Socialist Party. Now, just uh, a note here that this is, uh, uh, the Italian Socialist Party was already a pretty strong party, and uh, Italy already had its own working class tradition and so on. And so the Italian Socialist Party at this particular stage isn't really as such connected to Lenin and so on and so forth. It's its own, very much its own party. By 1916, he uh, you know, showed himself to be a very good writer. 
He was writing on working class issues, on their struggles in Turin and so on. And so in his own town, he became the co-editor of Avanti, which means forward uh, of the socialist, uh, the, the party's official newspaper. These newspapers are quite significant in Europe, party, and also in India and other parts of Asia, where the newspapers of the Social Democratic Party or the Socialist Party or the Communist Party enjoy wide circulation and are read more or less like Jung and Navai Bhaktas, more or less like daily papers. In Pakistan, party newspapers tend to be extremely tiny, 500, 1,000 circulation. But in other parts of the world, party newspapers can be very, very major newspapers. For example, in the United Kingdom, one of the newspapers that you can pick up from the newsstand is called The Morning Star. And that's actually the newspaper of the Communist Party of Britain. Similarly, La Humanité is a, the paper of the humanity is the paper of the communist used to be the paper of the Communist Party of France and so on. So um, by 1919, he had set up his own weekly newspaper, which was called The New Order. The Italian Socialist Party was, was you know, a very diverse sort of group of people. Um, so they were all socialists in one way or another, but it was, a, it was relatively speaking quite a, it had still had a very diverse uh, sort of ideological spread. And because of that diversity, it also, you know, there was also a lot of factional infighting, etc. And Gramsci thought that it wasn't a very effective party. Uh, and by 1919, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution has occurred, which is in 1917 in Russia, the Russian Revolution. And Gramsci is very much attracted to Lenin's style of leadership, uh, his, po his party, his understanding of how to do politics, and so on and so forth. And what Gramsci wants to do is to create a Marxist-Leninist party in the context of Italy. And the newspaper that he takes out, this new weekly newspaper, The New Order, is more or less dedicated to this, that particular function that we are going to popularize Lenin's ideas and create in Italy a party like the Bolshevik party in Russia. Um, in 19, from between 1919 and 1920, Turin, where Gramsci is an activist and working and organizing workers, experiences big mass working class strikes, really, really huge strikes. Uh, but sadly, by 1920, they are defeated. By the way, across Europe at that time, from 1917, 18, 1990, up to 1920, there are strikes and protests and revolutionary movements in almost every part of Europe. Germany, Austro-Hungarian Empire, everywhere. Uh, these strikes have a very deep impact on Gramsci. He observes them very closely. He's working with them very closely. He observes the workers very closely. He observes how they organize. And he's very much influenced, not just by the literature that he's reading coming in from Russia, but very much by his experiences there amongst working people. He himself is a, belongs to you know, the working class as a whole. Um, by January 1921, Gramsci com, uh, is able to gather enough support together with another leader called Bordega. Together they're able to gather enough support to say, we don't want to stay with the Italian Socialist Party. We are going to create a new party, which is called the Italian Communist Party, which actually goes on for, towards you know, sort of enormous success. Togliatti is the big leader of the Italian, was the big leader of the Italian Communist Movement. Interestingly, Togliatti was also a student um, at the University of Turin when Gramsci was a student there. There were students together there. Okay. Um, soon after the formation of the Italian Communist Party, um, it was, it follow, uh, there was a period of repression against the party. In 1926, the fascist government enacted emergency laws, that's Mussolini's government, um, on the uh, pretext that uh, mu there was an attempt, an alleged attempt on Mussolini's life. Uh, and so after that, po the police had, had already arrested Bordega, but now had also arrested Antonio Gramsci, despite the fact that he ought to have had parliamentary immunity. At his trial, Gramsci's prosecutor stated, for 20 years, we must stop this brain from functioning and he received a 20-year sentence where he was incarcerated. And that's uh, one of the shots that we have of him while he was in prison. After about 11 years in prison, his health had deteriorated enormously. His teeth had fallen out. His digestive system had collapsed. He couldn't eat solid foods. And he had convulsions when he vomited blood. 
he suffered a headache so violent that he beat his head against the walls of his cell. So, uh, you know, he was really in a very bad state in prison. There was, in fact, an international campaign for his release from Cambridge University, from uh, professors at Cambridge University. He was due to be released, uh, due to be released on April 21st, 1937, but he had become so ill by that time that he couldn't really be moved. He had a number of sort of diseases, many of which are so difficult that I can't even pronounce them, but uh, arteri arteriosclerosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, high blood pressure, agina, gout, acute gastric disorders. Good God, he was in a terrible state. Uh, and when he, uh, his release date was 21st April, by 27th April 1937, he passed away only at the age of 46. When I think about that, it depresses me because that means I only have two more years to go uh, if I was Gramsci. Um, and so his ashes are buried here. That's his, uh, that's his tomb, etc. Uh, but in this period, and despite all this ill health, he managed to write 30 notebooks, over 3,000 pages, on history, on politics, and uh, on philosophy, and so on. So, you know, despite all these difficulties, he was quite prolific in his intellectual output. Had he lived longer, you know, we could have expected more great things from him. His contribution to our, the intellectual heritage that, uh, of humanity includes his ideas about cultural hegemony, which we discuss in nearly all social science courses. Um, as a means of legitimize the capitalist state, the idea of organic intellectuals, what are organic intellectuals versus technocratic intellectuals, his distinction between political society and civil society, what, are the, what, what is that distinction, how do we understand it, uh, his critique of historicism and economic determinism, which is, uh, I think, one of the key elements in his entire thing, because a lot of, others, a lot of his other concepts like the distinction between political and civil society, cultural hegemony, organic intellectuals, really flow out of his, this main concern of, uh, of how do we understand economic determinism and historicism and so on. I'll explain these terms in just a bit, what do I mean by economic determinism and historicism. And fi finally, his critique of pre-Marxist materialism. And there are uh, loads of other things as well, I mean, on Italian history, on world history, and so on. But these are just some of the main, very, very big influences that people widely acknowledge. So where do we begin? So that was his life, in a nutshell, very, very briefly. Where do we begin? How do we begin to understand Gramsci's actual thought? In order to understand Gramsci, we've got to first understand Karl Marx. And in order to understand Karl Marx, we have to be on the correct slide. Right, so now to understand Gramsci, we've got to understand how Marx understood history and his criticism of capitalist society. And um, of course one can, you know, Marx was a prolific writer. The collected works of Marx and Engels are 52 volumes and you can go all over the place, you know, looking at nuances and so on and so forth. But the passage that is perhaps most widely quoted is this one in front of you, uh, in which he sort of very quickly sums up. Uh, this is the preface to, uh, what is it, the critique of political economy, etc., in which he very quickly tries to sum up in a few sentences the way that he wants us to understand history or examine history. And inevitably, because it's a preface and because it's a very, very brief statement, it runs the risk of being misunderstood, misinterpreted, or, you know, a sort of, uh, uh, there is potential for distorting how Marx understood things if you just read one passage, as there is the, a similar potential in reading any passage outside of the larger context in which it is being written. <coughs> but nonetheless, this is one of the most widely cited passages out of Marx's work, and very, very influential for that reason. So let's read through this passage, try and understand what he's saying. So he says, in the social production, wah, I have a red dot. <laughs> in the social production of their existence, men, and by men here he means human beings. In German they often, you know, sort of, they write men all the time when they mean human beings. Am I right about that? It's non-gendered, is it not? Is it non-gendered? It's the man, but it doesn't mean male. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know any German, but I know that, <laughs> and a few other things. Um, 
So uh, humans inevitably enter into definite relations which are independent of their will. So let's stop there just for a second. To produce and reproduce life, we cannot produce and reproduce life individually. We have to enter into social relations, right? We have to enter into relations with each other. As uh, to, to, to have children, obviously, we have to enter into uh, sexual relations. To, uh, to produce the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, we have to work together at some level, cooperate with each other at some level, to protect ourselves against animals that may try and hurt us and so on and so forth, we have to work together. So but what does he mean that they're independent of our will? What he means by that is that these relations that we form with each other are not relations that we can merely pick and choose, but they are in accordance with the circumstances in which we exist. If we are living in the jungle, we'll have to evolve certain kind of relations. If we're living in the mountains, if we're living in the... Whatever our material conditions are, those will determine what kind of relations we have to... we can create. Namely, the relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. So what are these relations? These are relations of production and reproduction. And they have to be appropriate to the level of development of their material forces of production. So what does material forces of production mean? It means our ability to produce. What stage are we at in terms of our, what kind of relationship do we have with nature? To what extent are we able to manipulate nature such that we are able to benefit from it? Though that will determine what sort of relations we also have with each other. In other words, the stage of our development of economic, uh, our economic technology, our ability to produce, in turn, the tools we use, the kind of tools we have created, in turn also determine how you and I are going to, uh, what sort of social relations you and I are going to have uh, with each other in, in that process of our work and production. So in an advanced society, with a high degree of technology, you will have relations that may be very different. For example, if you have a society where you could have meetings that are online, or you could wear a little, what is that called, virtual mask, and have a meeting with somebody sitting in Tokyo, right? And it would seem like you're sitting in the same boardroom, right? As happens in sci-fi movies, etc. Well, then that would mean that you could have a boardroom meeting without traveling from one part of the world to the other part of the world. And that would mean, of course, certain things about what sort of relations you'd have. These days, to give you another example, which is maybe more pertinent to, or you can relate to it much better. These days, you have thousands on, of friends on Facebook and on social media. And you, know, and you are impacted by them. And of course, you can read articles about how they are not really friends. They're just, you know, sort of social media friends and real friends are the ones that you actually get to hang out with and spend time with and so on. And I, I think there's something, to, I think that argument is not incorrect because there is something to real one-on-one -on -one interaction versus reading somebody's comment on a screen. But at the same time, it has to be said that those comments on the screen have a huge impact on your, on your, uh, on your uh, image of yourself, on your estimation of yourself, on your self-esteem. You get a bad comment in the morning, you know, somebody says, uh, you know, uh, something like, this is a dumb thing that you shared and you don't know your satr from your sophists or whatever they say, you know, you don't know anything, blah, blah, blah you're going to be a bit depressed throughout the day because those are real people. They're not robots and they're writing to real people and they do have a psychological impact. That's why people can be cyber bullied. That's why people can fall in love even on the, over, the, over social media or chase each other and so on and so forth. So for that reason, while social media cannot certainly substitute for real relationships, one-on-one -on -one real relationships. It is a relationship of some sort, a different one from the one that you have sitting in front of each other. Uh, you could be in contact with somebody who's sitting in Canada on a daily basis and not be in touch with somebody who is your roommate, you know, depending on how much time you spend on the internet uh, versus talking to your roommate. So what I'm trying to say is technology 
changes the way we can talk to each other, we can relate to each other, who we can relate to at a, any given point in time, you know, how, how many people we can relate to and so on and so forth. It does change that. And I'm only talking about communication here. Marx is talking about the process through which we come together and work together and that can be changed by the kinds of tools available to us. So he says the totality of these relations of production, that is the way in which we come together in order to produce, all of them put together, totality means if you take all of those relations in any given society, you put them all together, that constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure. So before we go into the superstructure, let's just look at that. So if you put together all the relationships that you have, Let's look at some of the relationships that, that are immediately observable around you. First of all, there's the relationship that you and I, or, or you have with your professors. Then there's the relationship that you have with the staff of, of, uh, or with each other. Then you have a relationship with the staff that works here. Somebody, of course, um, does the cooking and you go and eat in PDC. Somebody does the cleaning, the gardening. Somebody guards the, there are people who guard the, your university and so on and so forth. And we, even though we may not say hello to them, we may not, might not exchange pleasantries with them, but we really actually do have a certain relationship with them which keeps us where we are at, even if we don't want to recognize that. But that is the objective reality. So that, he says, you put all of that together, that's the economic foundation. That's the economic structure of a given society. And it's on that economic structure, Marx says, that all your ideas, your ideology, your thought processes, your culture, your laws, etc., your legal and political institutions, they are really reflecting or based on those economic relationships, relationships that we enter into as we produce. And to these legal political, to this legal political superstructure and to the economic structure correspond definite forms of social consciousness. So our ideas uh, correspond to our relationships and those relationships are the real relationships that we have in the process of production who does what work what role do they have in society in that work what benefits do they get out of society for doing that work and so on those are very very important in determining the political institutions which in turn are very very instrumental in determining our thought processes about institutions about work about life about uh, politics, about economics, so on and so forth. The mode of production of material life, he says, conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. So the way that you come together for work determines the way that you come together for everything else. Consider that we belong to, most of us perhaps belong to the middle class, to the upper middle class, to the upper class, etc. Consider that, uh, and through no fault of your own, because that's just the way society is structured, so this is not a moralistic thing, I'm not pointing a finger at you, but consider that most of our friends will be from the same class that we are from. They will be from neither from the class that's above us, nor from the class that's below us. Uh, the class that's below us will not, we will not befriend uh, because, well, first of all, we don't really have too much interaction with them aside from ordering them about, perhaps, right? And secondly, there is a stigma attached to that, right? We're sort of, oh my God, he's hanging out with, you slumming it or whatnot, et cetera, right? The, I mean, there is a sort of coolness to be, to be part of the, the cool crowd, and the cool crowd is going to be the elite of any given society. Mostly, I'm not saying everybody thinks that way, but mostly societies do think that way, that the elite of those societies are considered to be cool people, good, you know, uh, successful people. And people want to hang out with successful people. So consider, for example, that our social relationships are by and large formed by our class, which in turn is formed by our position, our positionality within, uh, you know, within the mode of production. <coughs> and um, this occurs nearly from birth. This occurs right from the beginning. It occurs so naturally in any person's life that you don't even think that it occurs. For example, I'll take myself as an, as an example. Here I am standing in front of you wearing jeans and a, a, a shirt, etc., speaking in relatively fluent English, if not a slightly Punjabified English accent, etc. Right? But all of, this, all of those things are really, to use slightly postmodern language, symbols of 
particular class uh, of a particular class status uh, if i was born in a village my dress would be very different my friends would be very different my language would be very different my thoughts would be very different psychologists do this little really interesting experiment where they take uh, teenagers or really young kids and what they do is they uh, they put a coin in front of them there was a coin somewhere over here i thought i saw a coin can't find it anymore anyway they put a coin in front of homeless children and uh, the, uh, and in front of children who are, you know, sort of middle class or upper middle class. And they, they put a coin in front of them, then they take the coin away. And then they ask them to draw the coin on a piece of paper. And what they noticed was that the children who were from poverty always drew the coin slightly larger on average than the children who uh, were from better off homes. And so psychologists concluded that you know, there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. Things that you desire, they, you know, you're w walking through a, if let's say you're walking through a superstore and there's one chocolate that you really love and there's all these chocolates on the side, but suddenly your brain is programmed in such a way that bang, if that chocolate appears that you really like, your mind, your eye can pick up that particular chocolate from an array of chocolates. That's how you identify things very quickly. That's how you identify familiar faces, for example, in a crowd of people. You can pick out familiar faces without necessarily looking at any, every individual face. You just look at the crowd and you're like, oh, I know that person. Right? How do you do that? That's how the, there, is a, there is a mechanism in the mind that allows you, in fact, to do that. And that works specifically with faces more than with any other object. So things that you desire, your mind focuses on. Um, and so children bought in poverty focus on that. So what am I trying to say? Our per very perception of the world is determined, by, you know, even perception of how large something is, how desirable it is, how much you want it, is determined by what you have or, and what you don't have and what others have. It, it plays a very big role. And it's easy to dismiss it and say, ah, money means nothing to me. But then if you don't have money, then you discover suddenly that if you really, really don't have it, that it that it deprives you of many, many things that are not necessarily material. It's not just that you, don't, you want to have more stuff, but it deprives you of many, many opportunities that are, can, be, you know, can result in you having a very uh, low self-esteem, a bad image about yourself, or will not give you the, potential, the, the ability to really reach your potential. So the mode of production life, says Karl Marx, determines uh, sorry, the mode, the, mode, the mode of production of material life conditions, the general process of social and intellectual life, it is not. So he sums all of this up by saying, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. So our ideas are determined by, are, is determined by our activity, and one of the main forms of our activity is the activity of producing together. This may seem rather odd to you people, because you are not yet engaged in the process of production, given that you're all students and you're right now what we call dependents. Your parents pay for your food, clothing, shelter, and you're supposed to only study. And you tell your parents, yes, 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 I'm studying, which of course you're not doing at all. But the point is, you're not yet part of the economy, right? You're going to become part of the economy soon. But as soon as you become part of the economy, it's going to t you'll see it's going to take over your life. It's going to be eight hours of your day, and after you're done with Hopefully you won't have an eight-hour job, uh, but if you do, most likely you will. And after you're done with the eight hours of the day, you will spend the not, not next eight hours recovering from the eight hours that you worked, and then you'll spend eight hours sleeping. So that's basically your life. Um, <laughs> speaking from experience, yes. <laughs> Although LUMS is quite good in this regard, that actually we get we professors at LUMS uh, have it quite. Uh, we have quite a bit of spare time, which we're supposed to spend reading and researching and writing and meeting with you people, etc. Of course, we do none of that. Nega, you're, you know, you're shaking your head. We do none of that. We, you know, play video games or I don't know what we do. But you know, the point is that uh, professors at the Foreman Christian College, for example, at FC College, uh, at the same level as myself, teach not three courses a year, but guess how many? Seven. They teach seven courses a year, exactly. So, yeah. But, you know, and that's why I can do lal band and all these other things. You see, if I didn't have, if I was at FC college, then I really would be putting in, you know, like, I don't know, 10 hours a day, and uh, I wouldn't do, be able to do all the other things. That's how, all I'm, 
the reason I say that is because I'm trying to show you how the work that you do determines not just the things that you have, but even also the opportunities that you have with respect to your own time. So, and obviously the activity you're involved in is basically what you're going to be thinking about. If you don't have time to think about, if you're, if you're sweeping the floors day in, day out, and uh, you know, you, or you're working in a factory, or you are in the, in the grind, then you don't have time to think about whether the Big Bang theory is correct, or whether there is an infinite number of Big Bangs, whether string theory is correct, whether quantum mechanics is right, or whether the general theory of relativity by Einstein is right. You're not going to have the sources available to you, the time to go through what has been written on that subject, to deliberate on those matters. You may have the potential, you may have the intelligence, you may have the ability, but you will not have the opportunity. And what are you going to be occupied with in terms of your mind is going to be the things that you are occupied with in terms of your time. So what we get from this is this sort of a, a metaphor of a base and a superstructure, a triangle. Uh, Marx here is using an architectural sort of metaphor, so we've made a pyramid out of it, where the, economic, the, the economy is the base and the superstructure, which includes art, it includes family, it includes culture, religion, philosophy, law, media, politics, science, education, music, literature, all of those things are in the superstructure. The base includes excuse me, everything related to the economy, the tools used, the machines used, the factories, the land, the raw materials, all this stuff and the various classes that are created in the process of production, industrial working class, managerial class, so on and so, so forth. That's the base. Now we come to the interesting part. So this was just the background. Now we come to the interesting part. Now there is a way to understand what Marx has written here, which can be very narrow and economistic, right? Which is that everything that happens in the superstructure, everything that happens in culture, everything that happens in family, religion, education, politics, whatever, everything that's written is directly related to some, immediately and directly related to some economic, direct economic cause. So we try to figure out if we want to know why a w particular war is happening. Why is America attacking Iraq or what is it doing in Iran, etc. We try to find the economic causes and those can be important. But a lot of times states will go to war even when there isn't a significant economic benefit to be gained. And we know this from history. We know this from history that, for example, the, 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 the British went to war with Afghanistan several times, two, three times in fact, not because they thought that Afghanistan had any economic benefit for them. They thought, koi fayda nahi hai. But simply because they wanted to make sure that the Russians don't take over Afghanistan. So they made it into a sort of buffer area. So they had no economic, they didn't, want to, they didn't necessarily want to gain anything economic out of Afghanistan. But they wanted to make sure Russia doesn't get in, so they went to war in those places. So you can go to war for geostrategic reasons rather than directly economic reasons and so on. So when we understand these sorts of things, we cannot therefore conclude that every action in war, in politics, in culture is somehow directly related to economics. If we do that, we make a caricature, uh, we, 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 I think we simplify uh, human life way too much. So, so that is called economic reductionism, the idea that everything is economics. Self-interest governs nations and drives the world forward. Everything is about self-interest, class self-interest, individual self-interest, state self-interest, and so on. This is too simplistic. And although we use this as an assumption sometimes to teach, for example, rational choice theory and so on and so forth, but we also recognize that this can be a bit overly simplistic when understanding the motivations of people. After all, people undertake, you must have undertaken, many actions that are economically harmful for you, but are beneficial in other ways. For example, you may have decided, you know, ke you, you, you give your friends treats, you say, ke let's go out for dinner, etc. You don't care about who pays for what, etc. with friends. Why? Because that's not really what you're concerned with. You, the friendship is much more important to you than, you know, 10, 20 rupees, etc. So you don't care about it at that level. Um, 
And sometimes you're friends with people who are actually bad for you. And still yet you're friends with them, you know, called codependent relationships, right? Sometimes you can be in a relationship with someone which is terrible for you, uh, for both part partners, in fact, for both parties, in fact. And yet you stick it out in that relationship, despite the fact that any rational analysis would have suggested you should get out of that relationship ASAP. But you can't, right? You can't get out of relationships in so easily when you are how should I put it, when you are invested in those relationships, it's not so easy to say, here's the calculus on net, my girlfriend has benefited me this much and cost me that much, so off with her head. It's not so easy, right? Yes. So Gramsci is of the view that economic determinism or reduction, oh, sorry, for, so before I get to Gramsci, so economic determinism or economic reductionism is the view that all political or cultural phenomena are determined by or can be reduced to the economic structure. And this is a bit simplistic, overly simplistic. Marx did say, for example, the hand mill produces feudalism, the steam mill produces capitalism. And it does sound very reductionist to say something of that sort. But you've got to remember that Marx is making these statements in the context of a discussion about history in unfolding over tens of thousands of years, thousands of years. And at that scale, to take something that may be true at that scale, that one society, one kind of society will give, uh, one kind of economy will give rise to a, ki a particular kind of society, another kind of economy will give rise to another kind of economy, may be true at the grand level of this grand scale of all of history, but it's not necessarily true. You arrive at the grand scale of history, Marx himself says, through various accidents and, you know, uh, movements that seem to be random and so on and so forth and yet you arrive he says at this thing. So Gramsci wants to say that in fact when you examine politics at the everyday level you discover that the base and superstructure don't just have a relationship one way that the base explains everything in the superstructure but that the relationship flows both ways. The economic base is really shapes and maintains the superstructure and in turn the superstructure is created in such a way so as to justify, legitimize the economic base. Hence not every change in politics is the result of economics. Economic structure itself is always changing. Leaders sometimes make mistakes. Some decisions are made because of internal necessities of an organizational kind. For example, a political party may need to make certain changes, etc., etc. But it has nothing to do with the economic base. It has to do with the politics of the time. So does that mean, you know, Marxists, by the way, Ismit Dono Lok Shami. I understand that many of you people will be like, yeah, what's the relevance of all this stuff about economic base and superstructure? How is this sort of, you know, changing anything in our lives and so on? And I can respect that, but I think you've got to appreciate, perhaps you've got to appreciate, ke, you know, the understanding that all of history, uh, the, 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 the idea that all of history could be understood uh, by examining how economic contradictions had played themselves out is a very powerful idea. It's a very, uh, it's an idea that uh, has played a very influential role in our times. And um, when you take that argument and extend it too far and you try to make everything come out of economics, then I think, you know, you, you take a, a good solid argument and you make it a bit, you know, you take any good solid argument and make it, make it a bit too extreme, then it falls on its face. Um, so I think that's why it's very important to be able to define, you know, to what extent economic the economy influences our, uh, our, uh, our social decision making, political decision making, our ideas and so on. But not, to go to, but not to go to town on it, not to go so extreme on it that, you know, every question has to have an economic answer. And I think that's basically what um, Gramsci is trying to explain to you is you know, how these two realms interact. So for those people who are, who are taking political economy, can we have a show of hands, who are, whose major is political economy? Sorry, economics with politics. So this debate about the relationship between the base and the superstructure is one of the key debates in political economy as a whole. How do these two realms, the realm of the economic and the realm of the political, how do they interact with each other? That's pretty much what a whole of political economy is about. It's very important for us to be able to tease that out in some way or the other. So Gramsci says structure is not a hidden god. Here he's referring to something that Croquet has written that determines everything. Structure and superstructure are intimately connected, 
interrelated and act reciprocally. Structures and superstructures form a historic block. That's a very important phrase there, historic block. And I'd like you to please write that down if, if you have your notebooks, etc. cetera. Uh, so a historic block is formed out of a structure and a superstructure. So superstructure is not merely unimportant appearances or an unimportant appearance. It forms the ideological and cultural hegemony necessary for the legitimization of the state. So, so we can't just say something is ideological, so it's unimportant. Marx has never implied that ideology is unimportant, Engels, Gramsci is trying to just reinforce the fact that to say that the economy plays a very influential role in how in our conceptions is not, to say, is not the same as saying that our conceptions are unimportant in the world of politics and so on and so forth, not at all. And I love this phrase by Gramsci where he says, by highlighting the anatomy and the function of the skeleton, nobody was trying to claim that man, still less woman, can live without skin, can live without the skin. So obviously, if I'm saying that you know, the ma a person stands on the basis of their bone structure, that doesn't mean that a, you, you can't have a human being with just bones. They have muscles and tissue and skin and everything else. And that's the whole organism. So to understand society, you, are, you should liken the economic base to the skeletal structure, to the bone structure. But that does not mean that everything else is unimportant. Of course, they interact with each other. You can't move a muscle where your bone does not allow, it, allow a muscle to move. I, can't, I don't have a joint here, so I can't make this thing move backwards. Actually, when once I fell off a tree, I broke both these bones, and then my arm was like this for a while, which was not fun. It hurt a lot. <laughs> um, but <laughs> given intact bones, it's not possible, right? So obviously, people are exaggerating the argument. So the, this exaggeration has occurred both by those who oppose Marxism as, and even by those who claim to be Marxists themselves. It's happened on both sides of the spectrum. So take, for example, Jordan Peterson, whose favorite hobby horse is, to, is, you know, trying to, is always constantly attacking feminists. Um, but now he's developed from there to attacking the left as a whole. So the, argument, the, the debate that he had with uh, uh, the crazy fellow, yes, uh, Zizek, uh, who can't stop sniffling all the time. Uh, in that debate, you must recall, Jordan Peterson made it out to seem like Marx is saying that economics determines everything, right? So he's pushing Marx into economic reductionism. So that's really what Gramsci is saying, that that's a caricature of what Marxism. Superstructures are an operational reality. That's an error, sorry. The, says Gramsci. That's, those are his words. Superstructures are objective and, uh, and operative in reality. Marx spoke about the solidity of popular beliefs. And when this way of concerning, and when this way of conceiving things has the force of popular belief, this is another phrase for Marx. So when a particular way of thinking about things becomes common sense, that becomes the politics of common sense. And that is a material real force that you have to contend with when you enter politics to change society. Right. Did you have a question? Okay. In other words, popular conviction has the same energy as a material force, says Antonio Gramsci. The philosophy of praxis, here again he means Marxism, itself is a superstructure, says Gramsci. It is the expression of those subaltern classes who want to educate themselves in the act of government and who have an interest in knowing all truths. To give you an example, is Martin Luther King Jr.'s sp famous speech I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It has no impact on the economy. You can't say it's derived from the economy. But it animates an entire uh, social, many social movements, in fact, that are working for civil democratic equality. And the fact that he can pose it in this particular way is very significant. For example, he could have just said, we want equality for blacks, and we want equality for women, and we want equality for all people, right? People have been making that speech for ages. Has had no impact. But when he says it in this way, I have a dream. Why does it resonate with the American public? Because the American public has been brought up on the idea of the American dream. And so when he relates his dream to the American dream, 
That's, very, that's a very powerful articulation of how the American dream needs to be changed, uh, or what the real American dream ought to have been, and so on and so forth. You see the point here? That's why he's powerful. That's why he's effective. It's because he can do that. To give you another example, Fez Ahmed Fez, when he says, Hame ye bhi tha ghanimat, jo koi shumar hota, hame kya bura tha marna, agar ek bar hota. Now that's taken from Mirza Ghalib. That's every, well, you don't know it, but in the old days where, where moms and dads didn't have TVs or radios, what did they do? They sat around the dinner table and they used to read Mirza Ghalib to each other. I know because my grandparents used to do that all the time. They used to sit down at the dinner table and then they would start, you know, throwing Ghalib phrases at each other and Iqbal phrases at each other and stuff. And I was there listening to, I don't know, you know, uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the French Prince or something, totally out of it. And now I can appreciate that, that how well keyed in they were with that. So when Fez takes a Misra from Ghalib and turns it around into something different, says, Mere dil mere musafir, hua phir se hukum sadir, ke uh, uh, ho vatan badar hum tum de, gali gali sadai, wagara. He, when he weaves that into the same meter and he uses that, you know, he's doing something, in, and he does that with all his poems, right? I mean, he's taking the style of ghazal poetry, which was all about, oh my God, I lost my loved one, and isn't life terrible and horrible and miserable? I mean, let's face it, all of ghazal poetry is about misery. Okay, <laughs> but he had, doesn't it? Okay, all of ghalim. Okay. <laughs> he's so miserable, come on. He's like lament, lamenting the lost world of Mughal greatness and, you know, his aristocratic uh, decadence is all constantly. He is, isn't he? Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Ghalib is, uh, Ghalib is miserable, but he's amazing. Just because somebody's miserable doesn't mean they're not amazing, right? Uh, but, you know, he, he's, he's a depressing guy to read. But he also pokes fun at his own depression, which makes him doubly interesting, you know? So, what is an erroneous way to understand the superstructure or ideology? Well, first of all, he says, yeah, we all acknowledge that ide ideology is distinct from the structure. It is asserted that a given political situation solution is ideological. That means that it is insufficient for changing the structure, although it thinks that it can do so. But on these correct premises is drawn the conclusion that every ideology is pure appearance, useless, stupid. But that's the wrong conclusion to come to. Just because something is the product of capitalism, just because something is the product even of feudalism, doesn't mean that you can just dispense with it and say, that culture was just useless culture. Sufism, good God, they think that the material, and Sufis, you know this, Sufis don't believe that the material world as such exists as a material world. They believe everything is basically the emanation of an idea. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's light. All of it is light. They believe that. That's what the suburb is. That's what uh, Vadatul Wajud is. Vadatul Wajud is totally anti materialist. But does that mean I can dismiss all of that because I'm a materialist and I believe this table actually does exist? It's not light. Does that mean I should dismiss all the Sufi tradition? Stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> Stop listening to Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan and all the great poetry and all the great heritage, etc., and just dismiss it out of hand and say, Tum ek ghorak da no, That's Iqbal, sorry. Or just say, ek nukte vich gal mukti, it just means nothing to me because it is pure idealism. No, you can't do that. It would be a non serious attitude, he says. You can't dismiss all of it as mere appearance, useless, and stupid. No, what you've got to understand is that there, you, he makes the distinction also between organic and arbitrary. Organic ideologies are necessary for a given structure. Arbitrary ideologies only create individual movements and polemics and so on. So first of all you, and foremost you've got to sift the chaff and the grain, right? You've got to understand that there are lots of ideas in society. Some are truly arbitrary, temporary and so on and so forth and can be dismissed. But organic ideas that are central to systems, to social systems, must be treated with greater care. These are relatively permanent uh, organic ideology will lead to organic movements that are relatively permanent. And these must be separated from conjunctural and arbitrary ideologies and movements that are occasional, immediate, and accidental. A common error, though, consists 
in, an ability, in, in our inability to find the correct relationship between what is organic and what is conjunctural. So what he's now going to show you is that even that which is conjunctural cannot always be dismissed. In the first case, there is an excess of economism or doctrinal ped pedantry, the overestimation of mechanical causes. In the second, an excess of ideologism, which is the exaggeration of voluntarism and individualistic element. So you can have an exaggeration of ideologism here and an exaggeration of overestimation of mechanical causes when you're looking at, at, at these causes. And you've got to stop doing that. You've got to understand the, the complex interrelationship between organic, uh, between organic ideas, organic movements, conjunctural movements, arbitrary ideologies, they come together in complex ways and we've got to understand them if you want to make real social change. He's a real craftsman. I mean, he's sitting in jail, but you can give him credit that he's a real craftsman. He's explaining to you, if you want to bring about the feminist revolution, if you want to bring about a revolution against extremism, if you want the end of, uh, you know, in Pakistan, you want the end of, I don't know, X, Y, Z, oppression of minorities. How do you do it? How do you convince people? How do you make it happen? He is, he is the, an architect, an engineer. You could even call him an artist of how to create, construct social movements in any given context, how to understand them and create them. So to understand and create them, you have to understand the relations of forces. Who's strong? What is the balance of power? We've got to distinguish, he says, between relations of social forces that is linked to structure, objective, independent of human will, you need the economic relations between classes. Then you've got to look at the relations of political forces. Konsi party strong hai, Konsi tanzim is strong hai. How many people were there at the climate march? Who are the enemies of the climate? How many others went to the climate march? Okay, right, okay, there you go. You know, who are they? What are their views? How do they convince people that climate is unimportant? You've got to understand that and the mechanics of that. Right? And finally, he says, between classes or between nations is also the balance of force of military. Who's got a stronger military? He says that also plays an important role. So let's go through them. The first one is kind of self-explanatory, so he doesn't really bother with that, which is the economy. Right? The second one he goes into, what about politics? What happens in politics? Well, he says in politics, social movements evolve at three different levels. You can divide them into three different kinds of social movements. The first are economic corporate level, which is that people come together for their immediate in economic interests. Uh, for example, tr a trade union in, in one place or a student union that you may form and you may say, Lums, we're going to come together to improve the food at PDC. I wish you would. Uh, not that it's that bad, but anyway. But that, what is that? That is an economic corporate level stuff. Then you don't unite with all students here. You unite only with LUM students for LUM's demands. Then what if all students combined? He says that would be the economic class level. It would be where you'd advance common interests of the working class, common interests of, the, of students, or whatever the case is. But these are still economic interests. You're still not vying for political power. The third stage is the political level. He says, formation of political parties to contest for hegemony over other subordinate groups. Now you form a political party of whoever it is that you represent, and then you try to build alliances with others in order to win the struggle. Right? So he says this is the highest level. This is a picture which is quite, you can't really see it quite well, and I can't really move to the light, but it's the picture of the Chartists, which was the first working class party to be created in mid-19th century England. And then finally he comes to military force. Quite shocking that he's discussing this while sitting in prison, but he does a trick with it. He discusses it, but he doesn't talk about classes anymore. He talks about nations. Because when he talks about nations, then nobody can object. But you can see that he actually means, because his interest is not national war, but class war, right? So he says, independence cannot be won with purely military forces. It requires both military and political military ones. So you've got to, have, you've got to combine politics and military in order to win these sorts of struggles. Military is also important, though, he's trying to say. The oppressed nation, he says, but actually what he means is the class will therefore initially oppose the dominant military force with the force which is only political military. You can't have a head-on confrontation with a stronger opponent. Okay? It's just stupid. It's not about courage or whatnot. He's trying to say to you, you cannot take on the American military just head-on and say, here I am, rock you like a hurricane. No, you can't do that, right? It used to be a famous song when we were kids. So what do you do? You have to have a political strategy. You have to try to destroy the war potential of the dominant nation from within. That sounds awful.
fifth generation war. And you have to compel the dominant military force to thin out and disperse over a large territory, thus nullifying a great power, pa pa part of its war potential. So you've got to find the right way in which their strategic strength is, cannot be deployed against you in one go, otherwise you'll be wiped out. So it's like a smaller boxer fighting a bigger boxer. The smaller boxer's got to keep his distance. He can't get in there and just say, all right, I'll take your punch and I'll give you one. No, no, can't do that. He's got to go around him. He's got to maneuver around him. He's got to punch, you know, find the loopholes, etc. Never take a full on punch from the other side. Yes. So what about economic crisis? In 2008, we had a huge, massive economic crisis. And a lot of times we think that an economic crisis ought to generate resistance against capitalism. But then we see Donald Trump get up. Then we see uh, Boris Johnson come up, then we see Le Pen get up, etc. We see all, we see Narendra Modi get up, not Narendra, sorry, Narendra Modi, Modi get up, right? You see also, you don't see the left. I mean, in fact, in India, the left has gone backwards. It used to have 62 seats in parliament. Today, it has five in the National Assembly. Of course, they have enormous seats at the provincial level. So they dominate the provincial governments of Kerala and West Bengal and other places, etc. But at the national level, they, they've all the way back to five seats. So what's going on? So he says, Gramsci says, it may be ruled out that immediate economic crisis themselves produce fundamental historical events. They can simply create a terrain more favorable to the dissemination of certain modes of thought and certain, and certain ways of posing and resolving questions involving the entire subsequent development of national life. They create the potentiality that, you can, that a certain new idea can become popular. But don't make the mistake of thinking that just because Pakistan is going down economically, the left is going to go up politically. That's not, that's not the way reality works, he's explained to you. For example, the French Revolution did not occur only owing to endemic poverty, but also conflicts related to class prestige played a very important role in the French Revolution, he says. And you can't dismiss that. Economic crisis can lead to contradictory outcomes, he says. The old society may decide to resist and may ensure its, its self-breathing space by crushing the opposition or a reciprocal destruction of contending classes and the peace of the graveyard may be established, perhaps even under the surveillance of a foreign guard. So it's not at all necessary that, you know, just because you represent the truth and the poor and the downtrodden, the oppressed, that victory will be yours in any given specific conflict. So what, how do we analyze this? And what's the purpose of our analysis? If we want to change the world, how do we change the world? Gramsci can be, re, the prison read notebooks can be written. The prison read, read notebooks or how to change the world. You know, you could just recall it that, right? How do you change the world? He says, the first purpose of analysis is to reveal the points of least resistance at which the force of will can be most fruitfully applied. This is, I think this is, Genius, okay? If you're going to try and change anything in society, this is, you should put this on your t-shirt or something. Why? Because you can't attack everywhere and you can't attack everything, okay? Uh, some places you attack and those places are very heavily defended and guarded and those ideas are very strongly entrenched. Those forces are very strongly entrenched and all you're going to do by attacking those places is, in fact, you're going to multiply the resistance against you. You're going to make yourself weaker rather than stronger by attacking where you are weak and they are strong. Okay? But if you attack some place where they are weak and you are strong, you are on the right moral ground and people support you and say, Yar, I don't agree with everything Temur says, but on this question, you know, competitive federalism is the way to go. Or whatever the case may be, because that's, that's Shamal's favorite sort of <laughs> pet project. The point is, you know, if you attack on that, on, a, on, on, on the pitch where you have a winning chance, there then you win lots of people who are otherwise not necessarily with you. And that's what Gramsci wants to do. They suggest immediate tactical operations. What suggests it? Your analysis shows where, where are they strongest, where are they weakest, where do I need to attack in order to win? For example, the the women's cause, you, you tell me, where would you need to attack in order to destroy or undermine patriarchy? What would be the weak point of patriarchy? What point would you attack at which, you know, um, you would gain allies and those who support patriarchy would lose allies? Versus what are the points where if you attack patriarchy on that point, the patriarchs would gain 
allies and you would lose allies. Those are the things that you need to think about in any movement, whether it's patriarchy or class politics or democratic politics. Take General Musharraf, right? So when I, when I, was, when I started teaching here at LUMS, uh, a few years after I started teaching here at LUMS, General Musharraf came to power. And I have always been opposed to military dictatorship in Pakistan, and I oppose General Musharraf. But a huge section of uh, people who are, can be called liberal or progressive or democratic said, no, General Musharraf is a, a nice guy. I said, why is he a nice guy? He says, well, you know, he's got these two doggies and, you know, he likes music and, and he likes Roshan Khali and so on. And he did. He does. That's true. And he was a, you know, as far as military dictators go, because I was born in the period when, before Zia came, actually, I grew up in the period when Zia came. Compared to military dictators, he was a pretty softy military dictator, I've got to tell you that, right? But the point is, so do I start attacking him on the fact that he's got two, holding two puppies and that he likes music and stuff? And how horrible. No. But when he made that comment about uh, the woman that uh, claimed that she was raped, and he said, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe she made that claim because she wanted a visa and uh, so on. Uh, and then, you know, when you made that point, when you sort of said, hang on a second, this is not on, and you made that a strategic part of your campaign, then that was a really weak wicket. Musharraf was wrong-footed. He didn't know where the ball was coming or going, right? So then you could, it wasn't just that comment. But then you said, you know, we don't want a ruler like that. You, began, you made that a point of entry for military dictatorship as a whole. Take, to give another example, Imran Khan's doing the same thing. I mean, he understood a, lo a while ago one very important thing, which is that the political elite, all of it, of Pakistan is corrupt, right? So either I get with the game, which he tried to do for a while, but there wasn't much of a game to be had because everybody's already taken the big seats, and what he was being offered was well, not worth taking, and he did the right thing by not taking it. Although he, Musharraf, in fact, offered him the prime ministership uh, and so on, but he was like, no, it doesn't make any sense because I have one seat in parliament and blah, blah, blah. So he understood that. So he understood that one thing that I can do, though, is I can get these guys on the fact that they are all bloody corrupt. So if I make that the main part of my campaign, that's a winning strategy, right? So he makes, he makes his party, Tehrike, what is it? Intasab. In the calm. What is it? Insaf. Oh, yeah, sorry, Insaf. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I did that deliberately. Anyway, so Tariqi in the calm, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> you get the picture, um, makes that the central plank and then drives that through like a, like a pile driver, right? That's all he's can, he can talk about. It's like almost like Imran Khan can't talk about anything else under the sun. But now he's so in, keyed into that that one year into government and he's still talking about that instead of getting on with the act of running the country. So, sorry if anybody is pro-PTI and feels rather uh, unhappy about that comment. The point is only to illustrate to you that to win in politics, Gramsci is saying, you've got to attack where the enemy is weak and you are strong. An analysis helps you find that. They indicate how campaign of political agitation may, be be may best be launched. What language will best be understood by the masses? What will give you greater and greater support? for your cause. Um, so finally, to conclude, he says this whole thing of economism, understanding everything through economics and not, being having, not having this ability to look at things in this nuanced way, he says, is a legacy really not of Marxism but of liberalism. Econom economism is not Marxism but the direct descendant of liberalism. The state and civil society are one in the sense that they serve the same class. The latter though, that is, um, the state works through coercion and the former civil society works through ideological hegemony. And this is again another key point uh, of uh, Gramsci. He says that uh, trade unionism, for example, deta, he says although it belongs to the subaltern class, to poor people, uh, and they, uh, but the independence and hegemony of the subordinate group is in fact sacrificed to the intellectual hegemony of the ruling class because trade unionism is an aspect of laissez-faire liberalism or laissez-faire capitalism. Right? So trade unionism is supposed to restrict the revolt of the working class only to negotiating the wage, whereas what Gramsci wants them to do is to question the wage system, i.e. capitalism itself. To continue, the problem of emancipation is not considered, uh, either the problem of emancipation is not considered, as in Fabianism, demand, or the Labour Party, 
or posed in an inappropriate and ineffective form, for example, social democracy, or because of a belief in the possibility of leaping from class or society directly into a society of perfect equality with a syndicalist, syndical economy, it is, it is left completely open. So trade unionism is not a successful strat subaltern strategy because even though it is a subaltern movement, this is a very cool concept. You can have subaltern movements that don't realize that they are conceding ideological hegemony to their enemy. You can have movements of women who do not realize that in fact they are conceding hegemony to patriarchy by let's say undertaking a certain slogan or workers movements or whatever the case may be. And Gramsci wants you to be able to sift that and understand where you are ceding essential ground, where you are ceding the, where you are conceding to the, your opponent the, 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 the hegemonic idea, there you are basically in trouble. You're not going to win, even though you may make a very big splash and get your picture on social media, but you can't, will not get what you want. Also, he says, this old tendency, we must not compromise. We must be uncompromising in struggle. Though that is the enemy. We are the good guys. The good guys fight the bad guys. And never in any Hollywood movie have I seen the good guys have a pleasant conversation with the bad guy, except for James Bond. Uh, hence, therefore, you know, uh, you are on that side, Tumudar or Hamidar, and there are going to be no compromise. He says, this is not how politics works. Politics cannot, you cannot be successful if you think in this way. In fact, hegemony, he says, presupposes compromises with other interests. You want your movement to be successful? You've got to compromise with other movements in order to win them as allies in order to be successful. The leading group should make sacrifice of an economic corporate kind without touching the essential. Don't give up on your essential, but nonetheless make allies in the big fight against, isolate your enemy and fight against them. All forms of electric, uh, electoral abstentions also belong to economism or liberalism. So that's why he says, okay, you know, we often think, oh, the law is against us. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the police is horrible, terrible. Yeah, it is. Uh, yes, the law may not be in your favor. Oh, parliaments are corrupt. Oh, politics is all corrupt. We're not going to do any of that. What's the result of that? It's a self-defeating strategy. You've got to get in the mud, he says, is, is what Gramsci is saying. You've got to get into the mud and you've got to meet with the police wallahs and you've got to say, here's a gender sensitization program for you. But if you use the word gender sensitization, they're going to run the other way. So how do you, how do you get in there and get your point of view? Or here's a labor sensitization program, whatever it is. How do you maneuver and convince people that you, that the changes that you want to bring about are good. That always requires, he's saying, compromises and getting into those, even into those institutions that you may or may, may not necessarily agree with or like. VHA founded, went on to completely overshadow the Socialist Party of Italy and became uh, the one of the largest communist parties in Europe. Uh, it became massive. And Gramsci himself, obviously, became uh, an intellectual who's read all over the world for precisely doing what you're saying he perhaps should not have done. But he thinks this is a better strategy. So he breaks with them because he thinks they don't have the right strategy. He's got it. He can do it better. And uh, to, to a very ex large extent, he does. He does it better, in my view. Um, most of the Italian Socialist Party, in fact, leaves the leadership and joins Gramsci's party later. So uh, what Gramsci is saying, aside from his strategic vision, is very similar to what, to what Marx and Engels would have also agreed with. For example, they, he, Marx, Engels writes, according to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Other than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. To say that everything can be understood from economics is not what we are saying. Okay. Um, similarly, Gramsci continues that economism, which is he also associates with the Italian Communist Socialist Party, um, makes no distinction between the relatively permanent organic movement and the fluctuating arbitrary movement. It cannot, these are his criticisms, all of these. Economic development is reduced to technical change in the instruments of work. It cannot even examine 
economic development very well. It is utterly false that people will allow themselves to be moved by considerations of self-interest. And it is entirely true that they are above all motivated by desire for an ardent belief in prestige, something that Max <coughs> Weber talks about. Prestige and status plays a very important role in our, our self-image and can play a very, very important role in how we view our position in society and whether or not we revolt or uh, conform to society, and Gramsci is agreeing there. Economism asks the question, who profits directly from the initiative under consideration, and replies with a line of reasoning which is as simplistic as it is fallacious. The one who profits directly are a certain fraction of the ruling class, and then they get into this argument, is Nawaz Sharif benefiting from this, or is Ardari benefiting from this? Whole politics then begins to resolve around a few individuals, which really is what's going on in Pakistan as well. The whole political question becomes around a few individuals, and their economic benefits rather than real questions about what's, what those policies mean for people. We start looking for whether XYZ policy is benefited in Imran Khan, whether it's benefited in Nawaz whether it's benefited in Zardari. But that's not all politics is about. You've got to look at how XYZ policy has impacted the people, the country as a whole. That's what politics ought to be about. So thus the political struggle is reduced to a series of personal affairs between the one between, on the one hand, those with the genie in the lamp who know everything, on the other, those who are fooled by their own leaders, but are so incurably thick that they refuse to believe it. Just Imran Khan says, these people are Right? That, that's what, the, I mean, Ramshi seems to be describing Pakistani politics perfectly, because that's what we do all the time. Right? We only pick on things which we think have benefited those politicians, then we make them into big scandals, and that's the whole thing that politics revolves around. I know, time's up. Um, he wants you to look at the social content of the mass following the movement. What function did this mass have in the balance of forces? What is the political significance of the demands presented by the leaders? You examine the conformity of the means to the ends. What do they want? How are they trying to get it? Are the two things working together well? And only in the last analysis and formulated in the, in the political and not moralistic terms is the hypothesis considered that such movements will necessarily be perverted and serve quite different ends from those which the mass of the followers expect. You've got to start analyzing the movements for who is in them, what are they doing, uh, what are their demands. All we look at is, oh, the flana leader is corrupt, flana leader is corrupt, flana leader is corrupt, and we think that's the end all and be all of politics. We do this all the time in Pakistani politics. He says this is useless. Get out of there. Last but not least, he has an aversion to historicism. What is that? The aversion to compromises is based on the iron conviction that there exist objective laws of historical development similar in kind to natural laws, together with a belief in a predetermined theology like that of a religion. Since favorable conditions are inevitably going to appear and since these in a rather mysterious way would bring about uh, palingenetic events, it is evident that any deliberate initiative tending to predispose and plan these conditions is not only useless but even harmful. In other words, we have become anti-planning. We don't want to plan anything because we think spontaneously khudi ho jayega. History is on my side. The truth is on my side. Appai ho jayega. He says it doesn't happen that way. The strong, uh, with those with better strategy win over those with bad strategy. That's how politics really works. So this religious-like belief, you know, we like to watch these movies, and in all the movies we watch, the good guys always win. There was one movie I watched in which the bad guy won, which is called No Country for Old Men, and I swear I wanted to go up to the ticket counter and say, give me my money back. I didn't get my money's worth. Because we want to believe the good guys always win. But that's not history. Uh, uh, you know, you must remember John Stuart Mill making the same point. He made it so eloquently and brilliantly in the case of Jesus Christ, right? He says, yeah, he was a good guy, but he didn't win, right? Okay, later on, Christianity won, but Jesus himself didn't win. Because to win, you not only have to be a... That's all what Game of Thrones is all about. It's not enough to be a good guy. Otherwise, Ned Stark wouldn't have had his head chopped off in the very first bloody season. You're a good guy. You got to, it's not enough to be a good guy. You've got to know how to play the game. And interestingly, that reference to Machiavelli is made also, because that's very much Machiavelli, right? You've got to know how to play politics. That reference to Machiavelli is very much there also in the writing of Gramsci, who often refers to his own party, uh, you know, the Communist Party, as the new prince, the modern prince, he calls it. Uh, refer, you know, saying that you've got to be as smart as Machiavelli wanted you to be in order to make the revolution. Right. 
Finally, Gramsci, his, this beautiful, I want to end it with this beautiful quote. The old world is dying away and the new world struggles to come forth. Now is the time of monsters. Climate change, I don't know, Donald Trump, Narendra Modi, whoever you want to put in that category. Thank you.